day to everyone. Today, I am privileged to open this scientific session entitled A Metrics-Based Evaluation of One Health Toward Control of Vector-Borne Diseases in the Context of Climate Change in Africa. The Special Program for Research and Training for Tropical Diseases is very pleased to jointly co-organize this scientific session with Fondación Bariu as both institutions that advocate for One Health as a field of research and practice to address infectious diseases of poverty among vulnerable populations. Today, we bring together several speakers with vast experience and expertise in the fields of EcoHealth and One Health. This session aims to further articulate the fundamentals of One Health as well as to draw insights into the conduct of integrative research using One Health transdisciplinary systems approaches, including a scorecard metrics-based evaluation for its operationalization. At this point, allow me to introduce this session's co-chair, Dr. Valentina sanchez Pico. Valentina is with the Fondación Mergu, where she is the scientific and research advisor and head of clinical research. She has led numerous international multi-center research studies on lower acute respiratory infections and emerging diseases including Ebola and other infectious diseases like rabies and cholera in affected countries, including those in crisis settings in refugee camps. And finally, I'd like to introduce myself as the other co-chair for this session. I'm Bernadette Ramirez, a scientist with a special program for research and training for tropical diseases based at headquarters of the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. I coordinate and manage TDR's work in the area of vector-borne diseases in the context of the changing environment, including climate change. TDR's current work are focused on research capacity building for operationalizing One Health in Africa. Now that we have given this preliminary introduction to the scientific session, let us continue on with the presentations. Thank you very much. Dear Bernadette, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It is a pleasure for me to co-chair this session. As we will hear from our honorable speakers, the session depicts insights on implementation research around the concept of One Health, identifying principles and capacities to operationalize One Health practices in complex systems at the human-animal-environmental interface. We will observe the experience from the TDR-IDRC Africa Initiative in integrating the One Health fundamentals in various projects promoting its development by putting into practice the application of this methodological framework. Fundación Meriu is an independent, non-lucrative foundation committed to fighting infectious diseases affecting principally developing countries. We are most grateful to have the opportunity to be part of this exchange with you all. Thank you. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome the first speaker of this session, Professor Bruce Wilcox. Professor Wilcox is Director and Senior Scientist at Global Health Group International and holds adjunction professorships at several leading universities. He is recognized as pioneer researcher and founder of the interdisciplinary fields conservation biology and ecology and health, including their societies and journals, conservation biology and eco-health. He formerly held faculty positions at Stanford University and the University of Hawaii. Good day. I'm pleased to make the opening presentation of the technical portion of this session, which is entitled Fundamentals of One Health the operational challenge to intervention design and implementation. One Health represents the call for a new paradigm. So what is that new paradigm? Well, that new paradigm is one that challenges the areas of health and allied fields to provide a basis for integration of health sciences and practices, mainly with those of environmental management and ecology. 
its aim is to better understand and manage health and disease at the so-called human-animal environment interface. As many of you are familiar, the proponents of One Health beginning about 15 years ago when One Health was first term was first coined, repeatedly point to the need to focus on the so-called human-animal environment interface. So this is a key tenet of One Health, but it remains to be operationalized uh, in terms of describing what is actually meant by that and what kinds of disciplinary and generally knowledge domains uh, need to be brought in to understand what is meant by that. So clearly, part of what is meant by that is, as you can see in the bottom of this slide, is that we know that zoonotic diseases, whether endemic, whether emerging, uh, new diseases, uh, whether epidemic diseases, for example, the Aedes aegypti uh, vector diseases, which you could see somewhat from this uh, slide in the bottom, uh, involve landscapes, landscapes that, for example, can be described in terms of a gradient from on the left, the urban, to on the far right of this uh, picture on the bottom, to the syllatic or rural wild species, for example, cycles. So we know that in order to understand zoonotic diseases, and particularly to understand the emergence of zoonotic diseases, we need to understand them in this context of where human populations, host species, and when vectors are involved, and of course, uh, microbes that are involved all interact together. So that's the real challenge of uh, One Health. So what this means is that we need to articulate this fundamentals, the idea of the, the principles and formulation of testable hypotheses. And we need to do this in the context of implementation research, aiming at these proposed principles that underlie the One Health approach. So this is basically a fundamentals imperative that is being called for. Imagine a, a textbook called Fundamentals of One Health. This is what we need to move towards. So this is what we need, for example, that people could utilize to develop core competencies, those people who are going to be researchers and practitioners in One Health, or already are. Thus, the basis for developing the knowledge and skills for One Health research and practice. So starting about seven or eight years ago, almost that long ago, a research initiative was uh, established by WHO TDR in partnership with the Canadian uh, International Development Research Council. It's centered at that time on EcoHealth. And there were a number of projects, uh, mainly four or five major projects, but here we are continuing with four of the projects that spanned four different countries. You can see the map in the right side, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, a part of uh, well, part of our we name as a country, but it involved the dryland habitats mostly. Baringo in Western Kenya, Serengeti at the border of Kenya and Tanzania, of course, working with a Maasai, uh, and then a project spanning three countries, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Mabira is an acronym that stands, that incorporates the idea of malaria, bilharzia. And so this initiative focused on several different zoonotic diseases, including what I just mentioned, as well as Rift Valley fever um, and other and malaria and so on. So the result of which was a network of more than 50 researchers from multiple disciplines and all these countries and more was created. And a remarkable uh, human resource, you might say. The result of which was a capacity building among this network, as well as new insights and tools that linked disease ecology, epidemiology, and meteorology in novel ways. More than this, it involved the sharing of approaches to incorporating traditional knowledge across a wide range of environments from South Africa to, the, uh, to Western uh, Africa. It turns out that these very issues, uh, including particularly this focus on the human-animal environment, 
presents an extraordinary opportunity, of course, to build on this knowledge, but particularly now in the context of the challenges we see that we have as a result of the uh, failures in many ways of preparedness, adaptation, and other needs that were exposed uh, by the, that have been exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So more than ever, we can see <clears throat> there's a need to uh, further develop, operationalize this One Health approach as we're describing it here. With that regard, let's describe a little bit about how these insights have uh, helped lay the groundwork to further develop then um, the methodology that was centered on EcoHealth toward a One Health methodology, which of course focuses specifically on zoonotic diseases. Uh, the first of these is, is really the opportunity to conduct integrative research explicitly employing transdisciplinary and systems approaches. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. And secondly, uh, to utilize an implementation research approach, that is implementation research really is about methodological research and use that as the basis for One Health's validation. Without One Health's validation, it won't be possible to gain wider adoption. And of course, even if it is more widely adopted, it won't be possible to continually improve it without explicit operational criteria and evaluation metrics. So specifically, what we will do in this operational phase, building on the TDR, IDRC Africa initiative experience, which focused on one Health methodology is that we will create a One Health methodological framework. We will refine the criteria for multi-sectoral cross-disciplinary collaboration and integration. And we will develop an implementation research methodology that incorporates transdisciplinary uh, adaptive management process. Uh, in other words, this amounts to uh, setting up a framework, specific criteria and so on, upon which we can further develop this, this as a methodological approach. So it's really the problem of, of advancing the One Health approach in a way that we have specific, that is explicit criteria that can be challenged if necessary, uh, and that allow for repeatability. Therefore, the idea of, uh, of testing hypothesis, improving the methodology. In conclusion, really, the major impediments to advancing One Health have been this gap between the veterinary and human medicine science and practice on the one hand, and that between these health sciences and others, public health, and environmental and sustainability sciences. So you can see in this image, basically what we might describe as a human animal environment interface, a particular place-based social ecological system that is a human coupled natural system. And this is what we really need to understand better. It requires a systems approach, in fact, an ecosystem approach, but understanding that this is a coupled human natural system involves human institutions and societies making choices and decisions about how to intervene in problems of, say, disease control, and in turn, the reaction or the response that the natural system makes and then how the human social system responds. And so it's a cyclic uh, uh, reciprocal set of responses that are highly complicated, in fact, represent a complex adaptive system, which you'll hear more about in the next presentation. So what this will allow us to do in creating this framing and using this actual explicit description of what is a animal, a human animal environment interface, allow us to uh, develop research teams, including the stakeholders, all the way from the agency representative academic participation, as well as the participation of community members, those with local knowledge, uh, and so on, and transcend these disciplinary silos. In fact, we might even see, say, transcend 
knowledge domains generally and bridging these gaps towards a more uh, effective prevention and control of, of uh, approaches for zoonotic, including vector-borne diseases. So in general, the outcome of this should be not only improved prospects for health, that is for risk management and, and mitigation for zoonotic diseases, endemic zoonotic diseases, epidemic diseases, as well as emerging new diseases, also, it will address the general well-being of people, which, which is uh, an outcome of uh, the local approach to building local capacity, uh, including local resilience and so on, which contributes, of course, to sustainability in general. So, in conclusion, these are the outcomes that we expect, although we can assure you that it will take a number of years and continued work to refine what is a rather complicated approach, indeed more than complicated as you'll see in the next presentation, in that it uh, addresses what are complex adaptive systems. Uh, that is, we're dealing with a problem that is beyond the general controlled environment of the laboratory and the clinic to uh, the environment that involves transmission dynamics, uh, human populations, animal populations, host populations, micro populations, and so on, which places us in a completely different category of systems, that is, that is complex adaptive systems, which we'll hear more about in the next uh, presentation. most grateful to welcome the second speaker of this session, Dr. Carson Richer. Dr. Richer has been a research fellow with Global Health Group International since 2011. He received his doctoral degree in biology from the Graduate University of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. His expertise lies in infectious diseases, complex system theory, sustainable development, ecosystems, and one health approaches and project management. His research focuses on the organizational challenges of sustainable transdisciplinary management of, of infectious diseases using his managerial expertise to enrich ecosystems and One Health approaches with organizational principles and guidance. We are happy to welcome Dr. Kasten. Hello, my name is Carsten Richter. I'm with the Global Health Group International, and I welcome you to the session Capacity Building for a Metrics-Based Evaluation of One Health. A metrics-based evaluation of One Health is important because you can manage what you can measure. But what is it that we are trying to manage? One Health means that we are looking at a specific health issue of interest within a complex adaptive system at the inter-exchange of human, environmental, and animal health. The common One Health model is a high-level abstraction of the interface of the social economic, ecological, and livestock systems, each of which comprising of numerous subsystems on different scales interacting with each other. A metrics-based evaluation of One Health hence requires a systemic analysis of the health issue of interest. Since this may be indefinitely complex to do in a complex adaptive system, it requires an analysis specifically targeting the health issue of interest. What is more, because all the subsystems are constantly evolving, it also requires a continuous analysis of the health issue of interest within the complex adaptive One Health system. And because of the many interfaces between human, environmental, and animal health, it also requires a multidimensional, multi-scale, and finally, integrated analysis of the health issue of interest. Finally, the analysis should detail how the health issue arose and what is maintaining it in the system. Therefore, we require an analysis of the factors, circumstances, and drivers of the health issue of interest within the complex adaptive One Health system. For a complete analysis, however, we do not only need to identify and describe promoting factors, but also factors that are inherently protecting the system by making it less vulnerable to threats.
Decreasing vulnerability means increasing resilience, which is the system's capacity to absorb, adapt, anticipate, and transform when exposed to external threats. Thereby, resilience may either be enforced or reduced as an effect of multi-scale interactions. So just as we need to analyze the promoting factors of a certain health issue, in the same way we need a targeted, continuous, multidimensional, multi-scale integrated analysis of factors, circumstances, and drivers of resilience within the system. Even with a thorough analysis, however, identifying metrics is not straightforward because of the properties of complex adaptive systems, namely nestedness, adaptiveness, nonlinearity, and emergence, which imply that the effects of a system's manipulation must be evaluated as a whole, rather than a direct cause-effect relationship as in complicated systems, for instance. That means any systems analysis must also consider and incorporate nested, adaptive, nonlinear, and emergent systems behavior, suggesting a trial and error research management style, or rather adaptive management, based on continuous knowledge generation and how to increase systemic resilience and decrease risk. A prerequisite for the ability to continuously perform an integrated systems analysis and adaptive management is the setup of a transdisciplinary organization. The core of transdisciplinarity is the full collaboration of all relevant disciplines and stakeholders for knowledge generation that is socially robust yet challengeable. Therefore, a metrics-based evaluation of One Health requires the setup of an integrative organization enabling and facilitating systems thinking and generative learning through a continuous transdisciplinary process of knowledge generation, application, and validation. For the adaptive management process, we start out with the Deming cycle of continuous improvement, comprising of the four phases, plan, do, check, and act, which for adaptive management have been extended to the six phases of assessing the problem, designing a solution, implementing it, monitoring the effects, evaluating the effects, adjusting the solution, and finally reassessing the problem. In a One Health approach, Adaptive management, unfortunately, is not that straightforward. First, in order to be able to even assess the problem, we need to set up a transdisciplinary organization, enable and facilitate systems thinking, and finally allow for multiple feedback loops for the recognition of new problems or even an adjustment of the organization itself. That means we require an adaptive management process challenging not only the current understanding of the systems as they evolve, but also the organizational capabilities to properly analyze and approach them. So, how do we set up a transdisciplinary organization able to sustainably evolve itself and manage One Health problems? The success of any organization depends on the core competencies that it develops and cultivates and that set it apart from failing efforts. Scorecards are a management tool to measure skills, processes, capacities, capabilities, performance and achievements related to those core competencies of an organization in order to be able to validate or adjust. In this project, we are developing a One Health scorecard to guide the setup and operations of transdisciplinary organizations aiming for sustainable risk management of One Health related threats. To summarize, in order to sustainably manage One Health related threats, we need an adaptive management process based on an integrated, continuous systems analysis performed by an evolving transdisciplinary organization with the organizational capacity to maintain those required core competencies of transdisciplinarity, systems thinking, generative learning, and adaptiveness. The One Health scorecard we are developing in this project will not only guide a respective organizational setup, but also evaluate whether such an organization is able to evolve appropriately with the systems it is aiming to manage. And that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer your questions. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Moses Chimbari. I'm a research professor at the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, based in Deben. My presentation today is entitled Operationalizing One Health in Nguavuma Community, South Africa, Towards Building Systems Thinking 
and transdisciplinary competencies. I will start off by uh, discussing uh, a project that I call a legacy project. It's called MABISA, which stands for Malaria and Bilazia in Southern Africa. This project was part of uh, a consortium of projects that were funded by TDR, WHO, uh, and IDRC from 2014 to 2018. Uh, the aim of those projects together was to contribute to reducing population, health vulnerabilities, and increase resilience against vector-borne diseases, risks under climate change conditions in Africa. My particular project uh, was contributing to this overall theme by assessing the impacts of multiple factors on malaria and schistosomiasis in communities that were semi-arid and were in Botswana, South Africa and Zimbabwe. This project, uh, the Mabisa project, was actually informed by a socio-ecological model uh, which helped us to develop a conceptual framework that I'm about to present. So this conceptual framework looks at uh, the combined effects of environment, socioeconomic uh, situation, and climate. Uh, and those combined effects, we looked at how they actually impact on VBDs, given that VBDs, which are vector-borne diseases, were already a challenge in the region. And we realized that with what has been happening, the situation was getting aggravated. However, we felt that if we came up with uh, appropriate interventions, we would be able to reduce uh, the disease burden and community vulnerability to these uh, diseases. The project was implemented in Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. We chose the study sites because they had uh, many commonalities. Uh, they were generally uh, rural communities plagued with poverty. These communities had uh, a scarcity of water generally, and the people in these regions are all of uh, Bandu origin. And so these various sites from the different countries uh, presented more or less uh, the same kind of situation in terms of health. We used the eco-health approach, uh, which took into account uh, the total environment in terms of the social dimensions, the environment, uh, as well as uh, the climate changes. And we placed vector-borne diseases in the center, which means all analysis that we did took into account these three dimensions, and they were informed by the six pillars of eco-health, which range from transdisciplinarity via social and gender equity right to, through to knowledge to action. In implementing this uh, project, we started off with a project formulation, uh, which was uh, started off by a small team uh, where we had a workshop uh, to conceive this idea. And then we went to the field uh, to all the three uh, sites to see what the situation was like. And during those site visits, we were able to meet with the stakeholders and the communities. And we had meetings with them. Uh, and then we sold the idea of doing this project and the project was uh, accepted by the community. Once that project was accepted by the community, we then went ahead and uh, implemented it. And uh, our implementation phase involved multi-stakeholders and we followed the transdisciplinary approach and uh, we actually uh, emphasized a lot on uh, uh, gender equity and we used various tools, quantitative methodology and qualitative methodology uh, and throughout the journey we made sure that we capacitated the communities. Uh, we also uh, came up with uh, some new structures, which we called community advisory boards, who were actually our boundary partners between us and uh, the community that we were working in. And um, because of that, we were actually able to 
then implement the project and get useful outputs through our participatory or appraisal situation analysis reports, technical reports, police briefs, facts sheets, and we did a lot of publications. I want to emphasize the point that uh, this was an iterative process, as you can see from the arrows. Sometimes we actually uh, developed uh, new uh, research questions as we were implementing the project, uh, just as it was informed by our stakeholders. I would like to also emphasize that we're chasing a moving target uh, in the sense that in 2014, when we went to some sites, you can see right on the left, it's a dam full of water. But in 2018, it was completely dry. It's like there was nothing before. Uh, and the same situation, this particular site that you see here is the same site as you see on the uh, right. Uh, and the last one here also indicates that at one stage there was a thriving livelihood through vegetable gardening, but by 2018 there was nothing because it was completely dry. And therefore this is the reason why I said we kept on changing our research questions because we had to understand the environment better and the livelihoods of the people. From this project, uh, we were actually able to determine the spatial and temporal trends of schistosomiasis using both remote sensing and ground data. We were also able to find out what the perceptions of the communities on the influence of climate change uh, on malaria and schistosomiasis were. We also um, understood the influence of uh, socioeconomic, environment, climate, and institutional factors on the transmission dynamics uh, of the diseases. And together with the communities and our stakeholders, we were able to develop a framework uh, for stakeholder uh, adaptation, uh, which was aimed at reducing vulnerability to malaria and schistosomiasis. Uh, this project uh, generated a critical mass of young academics working on uh, climate change and on uh, vector borne diseases. We actually got six PhD degrees and three master's degrees out of that particular project. Uh, our capacity building was also extended to uh, the, the, the community itself by capacitating uh, community members. And we also uh, published a lot of our work uh, we continue to publish some of the work, but as of now, we're talking of 40 publications that came from that project. Our community engagement process, uh, which is now published by um, Sesengwa, one of the previous uh, PhD students, uh, actually demonstrated that uh, we have got uh, a before and uh, during uh, the study and an after study phase. So the first uh, phase was quite comprehensive, starting with the uh, uh, formative research and a lot of uh, consultation. And once that happened, we then moved into the middle uh, lane there, where we were now working with the communities uh, and the other stakeholders in the area to implement uh, uh, the, the, the study. And finally, we we're able to actually uh, identify areas where we could say that uh, we could build sustainability and ensure that once we we're gone, things continued moving. So this is a model that we think you know uh, can work, particularly in uh, uh, multi-country uh, projects like the one that uh, we had in the case of Mabisa. Uh, also. That process allowed us to move from just informing the communities to consulting them, involving them, and collaborating with them. And we believe that by the time we left the community, they had been uh, fully empowered in terms of uh, our research on schist and malaria. I would like to pause here and uh, acknowledge the people who made that project a success. And these were our collaborating institutions uh, our community members, our researchers, uh, and uh, WHO, which funded the project, not forgetting what we called the community research assistants, who actually drove the concept of citizen science. 
But something that was unique was the fact that we used artists and school children and journalists for dissemination of our information. I now would like to introduce the OPOHA project, which is operationalizing One Health in Africa, and I'll focus on the South African project. So I want to also start off by showing uh, our move from eco health to, to the One Health concept. So as I indicated earlier on, the eco health approach places health, human health in the center, and then we try to address uh, the health challenges in the context of the environment, uh, the socio, uh, the society, the community, and the economy. In other words, we look at the total uh, environment, socio-ecological environment, and try to understand the health dimension. When we look at uh, One Health, One Health is also looking at the environment, it's looking at the human health, and it's looking at animal health, and it's placing the One Health concept in the center. So you will find that there are a lot of similarities there, but uh, I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, the concept of transdisciplinarity, which is common between uh, these uh, two ways of, or these two approaches of uh, looking at health. So for eco-health uh, approach, you need a transdisciplinary team just as much as